Tonight, fly the war-torn skies of Europe with Hitler's mighty Luftwaffe. Cloaked in secrecy, Heichel's HE-111 began its career as a fast and sleek civilian airliner. First flooded in the Spanish Civil War, it outpaced any fighter thrown against it and shelled Allied positions as a night bomber over the battlefields of World War II. Tonight, fly with the elite airmen of the Third Reich on wings of the Luftwaffe. If any single aircraft ever represented Germany's incredible bomber might during the Second World War, that status must surely belong to the Luftwaffe's Heinkel 111. Conceived in secrecy, but later produced in thousands, this streamlined design was to soldier on to the very end of the war. It was the definitive medium bomber of its decade. The Luftwaffe was committed to two-engine medium-range bomber aircraft, most of which had a brutish appearance, perhaps symbolic of the role they were built to perform. Functional, robust and deadly. They were in stark contrast to the 111's sleek, almost aesthetic shape. But the protruding barbettes gave away the Heinkel's real purpose. Despite its shape, it was a bomber aircraft, a weapon of war, and an instrument of terror. The 111's most striking feature was its streamlined glass house nose, which offered excellent vision. Although it was somewhat offset to allow the bomb aimer a clearer field of vision to perform his lethal role in selecting the targets. This model was actually built by another country and a license. And curiously, it has British Rolls-Royce engines, similar to those used by the Allies. But in all other aspects, externally it's identical to the German version. The 111 had a fuselage with a large center section, reflecting its original role, that of a high-speed transport. Nevertheless, a wolf in sheep's clothing. After the First World War, German aviation was constrained by the Treaty of Versailles, which however permitted transport aircraft. Manufacturing energies were concentrated on producing reliable and efficient transport types, which offered no military threat to the Allies. Gradually, more streamlined versions did appear, types like the Heinkel Model 70, put forward as a high-speed mail plane but actually used to test designs with military potential. By the middle 1930s, Germany was more overt about its contravention of the Treaty of Versailles. The rise of the Nazi party had re-instilled the feeling of national pride, and under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, the German people once again looked to the future and to the promise of greatness. Hitler had seized power in 1933, and it took him a few short years to establish men like Hermann Göring and Erhard Milch in key positions controlling the Air Force, and more important, aircraft production. During Hitler's years of exile, he'd written his book Mein Kampf, in which he clearly stated that the room Germany needed to expand lay to the east. There is no doubt that his ultimate objective is Russia. But he needed time to build up his forces and to consolidate his position within the country. To this end, several enormous rallies were convened, rallies of almost unimaginable proportions. But all the showmanship was for one purpose, to impress. And whilst the world looked on in wonder, Hitler's planners prepared for the next war, a war that they knew would be heavily influenced by the lessons of the Great War, where the tank, the submarine, and most of all the aircraft had each made its devastating debut. By 1934, German designers were receiving instructions to develop aircraft with bomber potential. 
Still under a shroud of secrecy, Heinkel, using lessons gained on the Model 70, offered the Model HE-111 as a high-speed transport that could be readily modified into an advanced bomber. A companion to the 111 was the Model 116. Similar in many respects to the other plane, it had four engines. To improve its role as a long-range mail plane, it was later fitted with rocket pods to assist its takeoff performance. All aircraft used substantial amounts of fuel during the takeoff process, and therefore, if the time spent in getting a plane airborne could be reduced, then more fuel could be preserved to extend its range. The 116 was used in many record-breaking flights, but it was also under serious consideration as a plane with some bomber potential and perhaps for long-range reconnaissance work, which probably explains why so much time and effort were expended to increase its endurance. But sometimes the modifications failed and caused disaster. Despite the problems with the 116, Heinkel persevered with the smaller 111. And by 1936, a few early models were flying as 10-seat passenger planes with Lufthansa. But it wasn't the civil application that really interested the Luftwaffe. Rather, it was the 111 bomber version, which had been built into the original design work. Externally, there's very little difference between the two models, except for the obvious protrusions of the two machine gun barbettes. Symbols of just how little German designers considered their fast bomber to be at risk to the fighters of the day. In 1936, this assumption was probably justifiable. Indeed, the 111 was as fast as any fighter available at the time, and its handling qualities were an improvement even over the single engine Model 70. Compared with the older bombers used by the Luftwaffe, the HE-111 was a major step forward. There was little to compare with it anywhere else in Europe. In fact, the closest competitor was another German design, the Dornier DO-17, which was another efficient aircraft in the medium bomber class, although it utilized a totally different approach in layout. Curiously, the DO-17 had also been designed originally as a commercial aircraft, actually as a replacement for the Heinkel 70, which so heavily influenced the 111. It too was intended to be a high-speed mail plane, although there would have been provision to carry up to six passengers. When Lufthansa first tested the 17, they found it handled extremely well and was very fast and reliable. But despite this, they declined the aircraft simply because the passenger access door was too small for comfortable use. The few examples that were built ended up in storage, where they might well have stayed had it not been for Robert Untocht, a pilot who'd flown the HE-70 on many record-breaking flights. Untucht later became involved in the Luftwaffe procurement program. When he came across the stored 17s almost by accident, it took him only one test flight to realize the aircraft's bomber potential. And soon the model was being redeveloped for military use. Before long, over 1,700 of these aircraft were ordered into production. In the years before the Second World War, in total secrecy. Both types of medium bombers were tested with various weapons. Here, a Dornier 17 is equipped for bomb release tests from the horizontal position. This is a very early Model 17. Its only form of defense is the single gun position placed high on the fuselage. It also has civilian markings suggesting that it still belongs to the manufacturer. 
although the tests would have been carried out under military supervision and with the strictest security. This remarkable film, shot in slow motion, gives some idea of the results achieved in low-level horizontal bombing, where the weapon is virtually tossed forward at its target. But in actual operation, the high-level drop, although less accurate, proved more practical, because it didn't expose the aircraft to ground fire. And in the war years to come, concentrated ground fire would prove devastating to low-level bomber attacks. Another type of technology tested by Germany in the lead-up to the Second World War was smoke screening. Artificial smoke clouds released just above sea level were considered an effective way of screening troop landings from shore batteries. And although the method was rarely employed in actual combat, it gives some idea of German military thinking at the time. There was a third and even more advanced bomber to fly alongside the other two Luftwaffe mediums. This was the Junkers Model 88. Unlike the other types, it was designed as a bomber from the outset, with no thought being given to its civil application. The 88 offered still more speed than its contemporaries and was overall much more versatile. It was expected to perform in much the same way as the 111 and in addition to do certain dive bombing work. Much of the Heinkel 111 construction was achieved in a showcase factory estate just outside Berlin. It was completed in May 1937, and German officials regularly invited foreign representatives to view the state-of-the-art production lines, in the hope of influencing, perhaps even intimidating, other countries with traditional German efficiency. To some extent, these publicity stunts worked, Germany's neighbor France was particularly concerned by what its military officials were shown. Doubtless those Germans who saw the Treaty of Versailles as a national insult would have found some poetic irony in this situation. But the fear of German enterprise was really justified. The Nazis were not producing modern war machines merely to impress. There was a functional purpose in what they were making. But first, a little time had to be bought from the Nazis' real target, Russia. And in the middle of 1939, Germany announced a non-aggression pact with Russia, although neither side really expected it to be upheld. Britain also knew that war was becoming inevitable. And without Russia to contend with, clearly the next war would be in the West. It was a war that Britain was ill-prepared for. Just how much so can be seen from its medium bombers of the time. Aircraft like the Whitley and the Hampton would prove quite outclassed by types like the Heinkel 111 and Germany's other medium bombers of the time. Clearly, Britain's military planners had not recognized the trends inside Germany. Even Britain's later designs, like the Bristol Beaufort, left much to be desired, certainly in the conventional medium bomber role. These aircraft were used in the main as maritime and torpedo bombers, where they worked far out at sea attacking enemy shipping. But amongst all the disarray, there was one exception to Britain's medium range bomber shortfall. The Vickers Wellington was a brilliantly effective and robust machine. It would soon be called upon to stand almost alone in the medium bomber mission that it was to handle so well in the opening stages of World War II. When Germany invaded Poland, both the British and the French had no choice but to declare war under their guarantee to protect the Polish people. The first British retaliation was a Wellington bombing raid on German ships close to shore. It had limited success, and the British were very careful to avoid any civilian property. But it was the first show of strength that the Nazis had had to encounter. With Poland conquered, 
the Luftwaffe quickly turned its attention westward. Norway, Holland, Belgium, and soon even France would fall under the Nazi juggernaut. And all by the formula of Blitzkrieg, as envisaged by the German high command. And right from the very start, Heinkel 111s and Dornier 17s were in the thick of it, taking their deadly message to cities like Antwerp and Rotterdam. And within the ruins that they left behind, the Nazis hoped to establish their new world order and a Reich that would last a thousand years. But first, they had a small island to subdue. Surely the British would fall or at least be prepared to treat and allow the Nazis to pursue their real objective in the east. From 1940 onwards, hundreds of German medium bombers would overfly their targets in the British Isles, expecting the same success that they'd learned to enjoy elsewhere. Confidence must have abounded as the first Luftwaffe bomber fleet started on their way across the English Channel to destroy the Royal Air Force airfields and the aircraft they supported. By eliminating the RAF planes, the Luftwaffe sought to gain control of British airspace and at the same time deny the RAF any opportunity to counterattack. However, this time things would be a little different for the German aerial armada. In many ways, the Heinkel 111 represented what early Luftwaffe planners stood both for and against. Perhaps the greatest of all the Luftwaffe strategists was General Walter Viva. Far-sighted and an excellent planner, Viva had great influence over the Luftwaffe even as early as 1933. Not a champion of the medium bomber, rather he'd studied Mein Kampf and probably knew personally of Hitler's ambitions in Russia. With this in mind, He'd been a strong supporter of four-engine long-range bombers that would be able to fly far into the Soviet Union and destroy that country's munitions right at the point of production. Unfortunately, Viva was killed while flying a Heinkel 70, and his plans were never put into action. Instead, larger numbers of smaller planes were produced. The decision to cancel the long-range bomber may well have cost Germany the war, Certainly, had Viva lived, Germany would have had the ability to strike deep into the Soviet Union and would have kept the services of one of its most able men in command of the Luftwaffe. One aircraft accident had cost the fatherland dearly. General Raba talks about Walter Viva. It was surprising that he, as an army man, you know, going back, army general staff, uh, how, how he could work into this new position as the chief uh, of staff of the Air Force. He did it in a wonderful way. He was of the opinion you, you can win each war if you have a great Air Force about. He was a very strong bomber and uh, that was the influence and he was of the opinion I don't need fighters. I need uh, bombers uh, which are faster than fighters. Werner Seitz, a 111 pilot. The fighter has so much advantage uh, compared to a bomber. Yeah. In many cases, you are just helpless, and you quite often you try to pray to get out of that mess. But if you had been attacked after you dropped your bomb lot, uh, the aircraft was naturally in a much better condition to make a defense movement. Nevertheless, losses of 111s over Britain were quite staggering. Additional protection was provided in the form of the long-range, heavily armed Messerschmitt 110. The 110, or destroyer as the type was known, carried sufficient fuel for it to accompany German medium bombers to and from British targets. Now, whenever the 111s left on a bombing mission, a substantial number of twin-engine escort fighters would attempt to provide the necessary protection.
Goering himself had championed the long-range escort concept and expected dramatic improvements when they went into service. But unfortunately for the Luftwaffe, although the 110 had the speed, range and firepower required, compared with the British fighters, it was not maneuverable. And soon as many German escorts were being shot down as the bombers they were sent to protect. German Messerschmitt 109s were maneuverable and probably quite able to defend Luftwaffe bombers from RAF Spitfires. However, their very limited range gave them only 20 minutes flying time over England. Not enough to protect the bombers on their missions. In the summer of 1940, Spitfires, Hurricanes, Messerschmitts and Heinkels laced the English sky as the Battle of Britain was carved into the history books. Given the limited range of the 109 and the lack of protective fire for the 111, the outcome was probably inevitable. Hundreds of German planes were shot down and many more simply ran out of fuel and crashed into the sea. In a few short weeks, the Luftwaffe had finally met an obstacle it couldn't overcome. Not only had its myth of invincibility been broken, but Goering's personal commitment to the value of the Messerschmitt 110 destroyer had also been demonstrated as mistaken. From this stage onwards, Goering's power would slowly wane within the Nazi party. Outraged at the early lack of success, Hitler ordered his air armadas to attack the British cities. The English blitz. But for the Germans, there were other obstacles. The British had radar, which enabled them to pinpoint incoming aircraft. As a counter, the Luftwaffe adopted another RAF invention by dropping aluminium foil to confuse the radar operators on the ground. This provided only a temporary solution as the blitz continued. But now, mostly on nighttime missions. And the aircraft fire was very good over England. They had uh, heavy anti-aircraft fire guns and they were shoot, shooting quite accurately. And like I mentioned before, there's those aluminum foils that help. But you cannot get away without hits in an attack. Few airplanes circling over, would name a, a city like London, and you have so many aircraft guns concentrating on you, and you are bound to get some hits. Certainly bomber missions appear to have reduced losses when they operated under the cover of darkness. However, the British also knew this as they deployed their first Lancaster missions into Germany. The Lancaster was all General Viva could have wished for. Long range, Tremendous bomb load, good defense, with its powerful machine gun positions. The Lancaster night missions repaid the devastation of the Blitz on London many times from the thin air over Germany. But whether with two or four engines, the crews of both air forces had the same problems to contend with. Flak, night fighters, mechanical problems, and something common to all men. Fear. In 1942, the Americans arrived with their four-engine bombers. The 8th Air Force was totally committed to the idea of strategic bombing of the enemy's means of production. And they knew the best way to achieve this was with four-engined aircraft, like the B-17 and the B-24. Clearly, they'd been following the same line of thought that Walter Viva had been preaching ten years earlier. Even the Russians had a four-engined long-range bomber, 
This was the DB-7, an enormous aircraft with a 120-foot wingspan. It was probably capable of performance similar to the Lancaster and came from a long line of Russian heavy bombers. Although surprisingly it saw little action, it did demonstrate that the Russians perceived the importance of having large aircraft in their armory. The other European combatant was Italy, which seemed to develop a passion for three-engined aircraft. They used a trimotor concept in their bombers, transports, and seaplanes. Whilst the third engine appeared to offer a compromise, it also denied the bomb aimer his traditional position of front and center in the plane. Instead, he was relegated to a post in the rear of the aircraft. The Italians carried out night bombing missions similar to the British and the Germans, attacking targets all around the Mediterranean region. But what is less well known is that the Italians also saw the need for large four-engine long-range strategic bombers, and given their limited resources, did very well in producing the Piaggio P-108, an aircraft which earned an enviable reputation for its reliability. Although not produced in large numbers, the 108 nevertheless filled all the criteria identified by General Viva. It had range, considerable bomb load, and adequate defensive fire, and in many ways performed at least as well as the Boeing B-17. The Italian Air Force frequently used their 108 to attack maritime targets and coastal installations. Given that the Italians had perceived the need for a strategic bomber, it's even more surprising that their allies in Germany never developed such a plane. Instead, they went on to refine existing twin-engine medium types to produce more versatility. There is no doubt that Germany had the technology to produce large aircraft. They had the four-engine Condor maritime patrol plane and several Junkers four- and even six-engined aircraft which could easily have been converted to bomber use. But the fact is that the Luftwaffe was required to interact so closely with the army that its aircraft were chosen on the basis of supporting ground forces and not for independent operations such as strategic bombing. Instead, they chose to upgrade existing medium bombers, like the Dornier 17 to this model 217. It had a long bomb bay and reasonable lifting capacity, but its major asset was that it was versatile. Not a specific purpose aircraft, rather a jack of all trades, ideal for supporting the Army's needs. Without alteration, this model could have been converted into a dive bomber by using the special dive brake fitted to the tail, a unique improvement over the usual dive brakes mounted in the wing. Apart from being a level bomber and a dive bomber, the 217 also served as a night fighter, used against British Lancasters with considerable success. Nearly 2,000 of the upgraded 217s were produced, including a few with a third engine, mounted inside the fuselage and driving a supercharger which fed the two outside power plants for high altitude work. Even the later Ju-88 was to be upgraded in several stages. This is the 188, with a vastly improved cockpit which gave the crew excellent all-round vision. It was fast and very maneuverable, and it too had to provide versatility. 188s could also serve both as horizontal and dive bombers, as well as performing certain fighter missions. On the other hand, the venerable Heinkel 111 had to soldier on without any major modifications. Much the same basic shape that Lufthansa had once used as an airliner. Trundling off over grass runways, fulfilling its mission as a medium bomber. But there were some attempts made to increase its efficiency. 
As in the case of the Heinkel 116, tests had been carried out to reduce the takeoff time and increase the range of the 111 by using rocket assistance to get the aircraft into the air. Early experiments using a liquid oxygen and alcohol combination as a fuel produced more damage to the aircraft than any benefit gained, and the first tests were discontinued until another fuel could be found. A much more satisfactory fuel came in the form of a combination of hydrogen peroxide and methyl alcohol, much like that which powered the famous German rocket planes. German engineers developed special rocket pods which could be quickly fixed to the underside of a standard Heikel 111 just before takeoff. One of the biggest problems with these propellants was their tendency to volatility. And if the two fuels came together under the wrong circumstances, dreadful damage could be done both to the aircraft and to those working on it. So the greatest care was always taken. Also, as a practical measure, the pods themselves were fitted with parachutes so they could be jettisoned after takeoff and land without any damage, thus allowing their reuse. As the piston engines revved up and the aircraft started to get underway, the pilot would ignite his extra source of power, and the 111 would virtually surge down the runway under the impact of so much additional thrust. Rocket-assisted takeoff also enabled the 111 to carry heavier loads. But this remarkable innovation was never put into mass production. Another demonstration of the 111's versatility was its use as a guided missile launcher. This new technology of death also entailed the use of rocket power in one of the many designs produced by the Henschel company. This is the model HS-293, a radio-controlled short-range anti-shipping missile powered by a combination of hydrogen peroxide and sodium permanganate which would come together to produce a thrust of over 1,200 pounds. Although the burn only lasted about 10 seconds, it was enough to make the missile 120 miles an hour faster than the aircraft that dropped it. Germany used guided bombs like these with considerable success in the Mediterranean and the Bay of Biscay. Their main benefit was that they enabled the launch plane to stay well beyond the reach of the enemy's guns as it launched its deadly payload. The 293's other advantage was accuracy, achieved by a radio transmitter mounted in the launch plane, sending signals to a receiver in the missile itself. With this device, the German bomb aimer sitting in the front of his Heinkel 111 could constantly adjust the missile's position right up to the moment of impact. The 111 was also heavily involved in another type of missile project. And although this design was aimed rather than guided, it had dreadful damage potential. The V-1, although usually fired from a ramp, could also be launched from specially equipped Heinkel 111s. And although sometimes dismissed as less than really effective, the V-1 was an appalling threat to the British population. General Eisenhower was said to consider it a major threat to the Normandy landings. Although the Heinkel 111 was involved in many of the more advanced warfare developments, in the main, it simply plodded on with its job as a medium bomber. 111s flew in every single theater in which the Luftwaffe operated, including the one Hitler so clearly identified in Mein Kampf, Russia.
From the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, which was the operational name given to Hitler's surprise attack on the Russians, 111s were in use. And throughout that dreadful campaign, fought in the worst of all conditions, this 1934 design continued to try to penetrate as far into Russia as possible. But its problem was range. After the initial attack, the Russians, in a superhuman effort, simply dismantled their factories and moved them east to the Ural Mountains. Here they re-established their industry and produced enormous quantities of munitions, far beyond the range of any of the medium bombers to which Germany had so unwisely committed itself. Had Weaver's original request for long-range bombers not been cancelled, then the Luftwaffe would almost certainly have had an aircraft similar to the Lancaster or the Fortress, with which it could have chased the Russians all the way into the Urals, and denied them the weapons of war, later to be used so successfully against the fatherland. From 1943 onwards, Russian factories produced incredible numbers of fighters and ground attack aircraft. Amongst them was the fabled IL-2 Stormvik, an aircraft of which over 15,000 were made, making it the most prolific aircraft design ever to be produced. And these tremendous numbers were achieved in just a few short years. By 1945, the die was cast. Germany's fate was sealed. And this could be seen in the number of wrecks that lay scattered in Luftwaffe airfields. The result of a relentless pounding from the ground and from the air as the Allies closed in on all fronts. Now, a number of 111s would start to fall into Allied hands. Of course, individual examples had been captured throughout the war. And the British in particular were quite familiar with the type. They sometimes even used it in their own service for transport. But as the war came to an end, there was an opportunity to study the 111 more closely, to see how it worked, and to examine the secrets of its construction. This is an American recovery team in the process of dismantling a later model 111, recently seized as a war prize. It would be disassembled just enough to permit it to be crated and sent back to America by sea. Comparisons could then be made about the finer points of its construction. Even though in many ways it was an obsolete bomber long before the war was over, the Luftwaffe had demonstrated that the 111 had many worthy points that the American Air Force was keen to analyze at its research headquarters in Ohio. Certainly there must be something to be said for a plane that was designed in 1934, once used as an airliner, and then produced as a bomber to the tune of no less than 7,300 examples during the succeeding 10 years. But one of the arguments against producing the four-engine Ural bomber had been simply that every example of such a strategic weapon would have cost the Germans the equivalent of two and a half 111s in terms of raw material and manpower. If only 1,000 of Viva's Ural bombers had been produced, at least in time to follow the Russians on their retreat, then Germany might have gained another 12 months more than enough time for its jet and rocket technology to have slowed the Allied air offensive and perhaps left the country at least in a position to negotiate. Before Germany attacked Poland and triggered the conflagration that followed, it had tested its weapons in the Spanish Civil War, which the Nazis regarded as nothing more than a proving ground or a dress rehearsal for the real thing. They explored techniques like Blitzkrieg and provided the latest weaponry at the time, the Junkers 86 medium bomber, 
the 87 Stuka dive bomber, and the first production model of the Heinkel 111, which differed from the later models by having a more conventional cockpit. These aircraft were then the high point of German war technology and contributed greatly to Hitler's long-term plans at appalling cost to the Spanish people. The irony is that the sole surviving airworthy 111 was produced in Spain, although by this time Hitler, Goering and Viva were long dead. The Spaniards, still feeling the need for some security, kept an outdated design on the production lines, as much as transport and liaison aircraft as a tactical weapon. This particular example is even more special because it was the personal transport of General Franco, the fascist ruler, who had accepted so much German assistance. Years later, the aircraft was acquired for a role in the film The Battle of Britain, and afterwards it found its way to the United States and the care of the Confederate Air Force. The major difference between Franco's Heinkel and those which caused such devastation over Europe is that it employs Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, ironically similar to the ones which were used in Spitfires and Hurricanes to chase the 111s across the skies of Britain. Spitfires were also used by the Russians and the Merlin engines were fitted to later Mustangs, another aircraft which the 111 had to contend with in its long career. Conceived in secrecy because of the constraints of Versailles, the 111 only briefly fooled the world when it was first put forward as an airliner its real purpose was clearly that of a medium-range bomber to support Hitler's blitzkrieg across Europe. Together with the Dornier and Junker's designs of similar proportions, it did its job and did it well. But it never succeeded in filling the role of the long-range bomber whose importance Viva had predicted. The Heinkel 111 will be remembered as the secret bomber.